from the deepest, darkest recesses of Dangerous Nerds headquarters. Keith Moncrief and Gary Cassell. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Pop Culture Minefield. That, 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 that down there, that's, that's Keith. And that's Gary. And we have a very special guest here today in our ongoing series of interviews with uh, uh, many of my comic pro friends is uh, Mr. Rick Stassi. Well, pretty close. Well, here's the first thing you can get it's Stacy. Stacy. The rise of, uh, rise of Dick Tracy. Well, I saw it the first time. I thought it was Stasi because you uh, I figured you were Italian. It, yeah, and Stasi is German, and Stacy is Italian, and they were the twain shall meet. Oh, no, okay. It's, it's the ich, right weiß, ich weiß nicht, mein Freund. Ich weiß nicht. Ach, um, you. So, uh, uh, you so uh, we met at a wonderful convention run by a mutual friend, John, uh, down or up in Smallville. And uh, the Smallville Comic Con, and uh, I, I was just like, uh, I felt like a, a, a milk bucket under a bowl up there at first. It ended up being one of my favorite cons experiences of all time, and it also had, in my opinion, one of the funniest moments that'll never happen again. And nobody got it on camera. Was when you and I did a panel together about working in the comic industry, and my fucking chair broke. Yes. And I just disappeared underneath the table. Yes. And, and we, I, I jumped up. So well. What's that? We planned that so well. So oh, you, you planned that. Yeah, it was kind of a prop kind of thing we did. So. No. I jumped up. I said, I'm okay, but please tell me somebody got that on camera. <laughs> All of you got cameras. Nobody got it on camera. Not one person had their camera going. Oh. I'm like, you buttholes. <laughs> It'll never happen again to no. any comic artist. Uh, there is. <laughs> But that was such a fun show, and uh, and I got to become friends with you because of that show, yeah. and uh, and as time has gone by since we met, we've become better and better friends. Yes. Um, uh, talking about a variety of different things, I love that you're a true Renaissance man. You're an artist, a writer, you're a poet. Yes. Um, you know, you put out two CDs. <laughs> yep, there you go. Uh, celebrated <laughs> comic, uh, you know, comic <laughs> artist turned author. Um, just you know, but when I what I want to go back to yeah, there's the CD. Uh, send me the links and I'll make sure to add those to the video down below okay. um, in the comments. Okay. Um, but basically, you know, I know that uh, you know my mom said that I was born with a pencil in my hand, which of course would have been very painful if it if were yeah. real. And so, but I was drawing from very early age. And I was drawing first profiles, and then I, I, you know, I learned to draw three quarter, and then full on face, and then all these different things. By the time I was thirteen, I could draw everything but hands. I didn't learn to draw hands properly until I was about eighteen. Wow. Uh, whereas my son, uh, all my kids are artists. Uh, my son Benjamin just took yep. it up at thirteen. He was thirteen, was drawing hands, and I'm like, you little bastard. Ah. And but uh, he is—he's a gifted artist, an amazing writer. But um, you, when did you start drawing? Uh, I started drawing. I picked up a pencil at a very early age. By that I mean the golden days of TV, because I was raised in front of the TV when TV was just you know out. We're talking the very early fifties, and I saw a gentleman named Roy, a very heavy set gentleman on Mickey Mouse Club. And he had a big pad of paper and he had a big marker and he'd take circles. He'd go, whoosh, 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 whoosh. it was Mickey Mouse. And I thought, that's really, really cool. So on the rare occasion that I found notepads and pencils uh, around the house, I would not be able to do that. But I knew that if you assembled circles, geometric shapes appropriately and convincingly, there's your operative word, you could make Mickey Mouse, and 20 years later, you can make Spider-Man, and you can make Doctor Doom, or you can make Superman, or what have you. So uh, um, that was a hand-to-eye coordination that I had at a very young age that my father really wanted me to walk away from because all the Stacys back in those days really wanted to play pro baseball. So I've got a cousin I still see. He's That's what my dad wanted me to do. He wanted me to box, play football, and play baseball. Exactly. 
Uh, I got a cousin that I'm very close to right now. He's in his early 80s. He looks like he's in his early 60s. And he played pro ball for a while. His dad before him played professional ball. His dad, Johnny Stacy, back in the day, his first professional game was Babe Ruth's last game. Or so, wow. the, so the lore goes. But I believe this stuff, too. Uh, my dad was, was stocky and short, and he never made it past – uh, just local leagues here to be the catcher that he wanted to be. So put that pencil down, get outside with that bat, and swing that bat. And good hand-eye coordination that you can do this, you can do that. So work on your fastball, work on this and that. Um, I, I took the the attraction to assembling those circles, and I took the hand-eye coordination, and they laid dormant for me a little bit because the fun was taken out of baseball when you got to do it all the time. It's like, what's that mm -hmm. boy? You play like a six year old. Well, I, I am a six year old. I really am. So, but uh, if I could just jump into this, being in front of a TV screen all the time and loving it, I watched faithfully and religiously George Reeves and the Adventures of Superman. Therein lies the imagination and the three. Uh, a story apartment we lived in. I put that little towel on the back of my shirt. I think we all might have done that. And I went out on the porch, and um, I looked at the skyline of Kansas City, and I saw the Power and Light building. You ought to Google it. It's really pretty. And at night, it changes colors. It's so magical and, and mystical. And to me, I thought it was the Daily Planet. And then later, we moved back to the burbs, and, and I still went right outside with a towel on my shirt watch every episode of Superman, and I embrace that moral compass, the sense of adventures, and storytelling heroism, and I started to think, as it planted seeds in me, I really want to be that when I grow up. Well, the day after my seventh birthday, okay, I got up, walked out to the kitchen and living room with my mom, and I still, I'm sure, could taste the sugar from the birthday cakes and the streamers and all this stuff little kids have, now, my task was just to go out to the driveway and bring in the morning paper, the Kansas City Times at that time. Walked out to get the paper, picked it up, and I looked, and there in beautiful black and white is a photograph of Superman. It's George Reeves. I never seen a comic book. Who cares about comic books? I saw this, and I ran inside because that connection into reality had been made. And I said, Mom, let's pop the screen off this. What did it say? She opens it up. She goes, oh, Superman killed himself. First day of being seven, I deflate. I can't, I have no tools to understand what that means. Because Superman's indestructible. And I went back to my room where I had a pad of paper and a number two pencil. I started drawing stick figures to deal with this, the shock. If you've seen Hollywood Land, you saw a bunch of, and Ben Affleck in many cases did well, the segments of vignettes of this. Little kids couldn't deal with this, okay? And this is how I dealt with it. Started drawing, and I've never, ever stopped. And that's what got me into this obsession to filling every bit of open paper all the time, pencil, pen, don't care what it is, and it usually is a heroic, it's usually Superman. Do you grow up, you think, let's do Batman. Well, I'm older now. I'm about the same age as Peter Parker. Let's do Spidey. You know, let's let's do all these other characters. But that's my genesis for this. And I'm going to plug my website, which is www.rickstacy.com. And it says this, that, and the other. The this on there is the same origin story as attested to by Loretta Swit from MASH. Because we met after a screening of Hollywood Land back in 2006. She said, what are you doing here, all this George Reeves stuff? And she was a fan. I told her this story. I just told you. And she kissed me. Just, when Hot Lips kisses you, you stay a kiss. And I said, what was that for? You want to take, take this back to the clothes closet? <laughs> exactly. exactly. And I said, what was I'm that gonna for? I'm going to make out with Hot Lips hula here. And I called my wife immediately and said, there's something you should know. But um, what, what's that called? My hall, your hall pass? Was that your hall pass? Yeah, that's, <laughs> you got a note from my wife, and it's okay. But um, that's my website. And I said, Why, thank you 
Dan, why, why did you do that? She goes, dear boy, if you don't realize this, you're still drawing because you're still in therapy. And I thought, whoa, maybe that's why all this stuff. I'm not obsessed with a lot of things, but maybe that's why I, I, I had a motivation to draw, to tell stories that ended more happily than what we saw with George Reeves and the chronicle stuff like that. So, No, it's, it's oh. um, I totally get that because um, – I'm younger than you. Uh, Everybody is. Yeah, you all whip a snapper. Oh, damn well. Is it younger? <laughs> I taught Bernie Sanders this. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> well, uh, but basically, I still fall into that that group. I got called a boomer the other day, and technically, I'm a boomer, but because my parents weren't World War II family, weren't a World War II family. Right. Um. I'm technically not a boomer because I was raised in the same mindset of the kids from 1965 on. So um, I have the same, I'm a generation X personality type. Right. And, uh, but I still draw from Superman, the, the TV show, because I was glued to that. And I was in the fourth grade when I found out he was dead yeah. and had shot himself. And I had that same profound reaction, like what? Yeah. Because so, well, actually, some kid had said that he had jumped off a roof. Oh, people said everything. It, it, all kinds of crazy stories came up. But but in point of fact, I have been so fortunate over the years uh, to work with remaining cast members. What I mean by that is I, I brought Noel Neal in for her first show in Wichita in 1980. She did a couple of college things, but never a convention. And she came in, and uh, we spent a lot of time together. As we would over the years, there are other shows, the uh, 50th anniversary of Superman in Cleveland with all the stars, etc. Right. The longer I'm around Noel Neal and then Jack Larson, who played it a little closer to his best, and many other people, including some experts along the line of George Reeves, his life, and his unfortunate demise, I really wouldn't tell you that he killed himself. And I'm not I don't, I don't believe it for a second. Yeah, I'm not going to stand up here and say that, that, that he didn't, but if I was going to bet money, I would bet that his demise came from maybe the Tony Mannix faction with uh, uh, her husband, Eddie Mannix, the fixer, maybe with uh, his uh, fiance, whose name's going to escape her right now. But uh, Yeah, but she was batshit crazy. Yeah, Lenore Lemon. She was yeah. uh, nuts. Totally, total nut job. Uh, no, I go along the lines of the one theory that was in the movie Hollywood Land, which is, um, yeah, it was her. I don't believe the the husband because he was aware of that stuff. Um, he had his own problems, and I think that he looked at that as sort of like a, a relief that he didn't have to deal with things. Um, he was relieved that she was leaving him alone because they had a, a what was a, a, an unconventional marriage. And very he, much so. And she was. A, <clears throat> I grew up on that. With my dad, uh, my dad was, that was the one thing we shared in common, his love of history. And he was really caught up into Hollywood history. Uh, he would read a lot of biographies about Forrest Tucker and his giant dick. Um, you know, just, I'm like, why are you telling me these things? I'm 10 years old. No. No. <laughs> like, I like Ghostbusters. This is before the movie Ghostbusters. I liked Spencer Tracy and Kong, and yep. uh, why are you telling? He's on F Troop. Why are you telling me about his penis? I don't want to know. But that was my dad. Uh, I knew Jim Neighbors was gay back w when I was uh, eight years old because wow. of my dad. Wow, wow. Yeah, Rock, Rock Hudson too because of my dad. My yeah. dad was aware of all this shit. Uh, and yeah. God knows, you know, uh, how he knew all of it because not all of that is in books. But mm -hmm. he, he would read and talk to people and just learn things. And sure. So, but I've always believed that he was murdered and it had an impact on me the same way it did with you. Uh, but here's the interesting thing like you, I was not a Superman comic fan, I was a cinematic television Superman fan. Um, I didn't really read, I read like two comics of Superman when I was a kid because they were at my grandparents'. And one of them is when um, Brainiac collects them into the dome. Exactly. I remember reading that one. Yeah. I, I read another story. It was like a super annual. And past that, I, I did. I was not interested in him as a comic book character. I was interested in him as the more three-dimensional character that you saw on TV and, and in the, in the uh, movies. 
and uh, you know Christopher Reeve, George Reeve, uh, those two men will always be my Superman. Though I am absolutely man loved with uh, what is that guy's name? Uh, Henry Cavill. He was good. I'm just going to ignore this. Thank you. Sorry. No problem, bro. So, you know, it's like uh, Henry Cavill, when I heard him in an interview, because I didn't like the film. I was unhappy with the film. But then he did an interview, and I've talked to Keith at nauseum about this. When he started talking about who Superman was, I my heart opened up to this guy, and I said, please, somebody give him a chance to play Superman correctly. Stop making Zack Snyder Superman. Start yeah. making Superman with this guy, because he right. gets it. Yep. Yeah. And uh, he understood it the way Christopher Reeve understood it. <clears throat> or at least I, I always believed Christopher Reeve understood it until he made that last one about nuclear war. Oh. And then yeah. it was like, oh, you completely forgot what Superman's about. He would not do that. He right. would not. In fact, everybody told you not to do that. Don't do that with Superman because he can't do that. He can't interfere that way. Right. right. You know, it's interesting you talk about Henry Cable. Uh, I can call myself a Superman purist, which is laughable because there's so many different visages of Superman. There's the George Reeves that is why I'm in this chair today. Uh, there's the little kid about six months after the death of George Reeves left Red's Barber Shop in downtown Overland Park. I was supposed to stay there. My dad said, you stay at the barber shop and I'll come get you when I come get you. Okay. And I paid the barber, I had 25 cents. And I walk next door to Shalinsky's Drug Store. Just walk next door. Little kid. Probably seven still. And looking around, I thought, maybe I'll get some candy. Maybe I'll get some gum. I better get back to the barbershop for my dad. It just kills me. And on the bottom row of the magazine rack, I see the first Superman annual. And my eyes got like this bit. Because I'd never seen color, him in color. I thought, what? The, you know, yeah. gold. Red, red, yellow, blue. What's like, this color? Yeah, like a one is the Superman black and white. And he had the little thing coming down here, like you know, Girl. and uh, uh, which I'm pushing mine back all of a sudden. But uh, um, I bought it and went back to the barber shop. My dad never knew I left. Went home and I bought it and I thumbed through it because I really didn't care that much about stories at that point. But I bought it to trace the cover. And trace anything I could see inside if there was thin enough paper and, and start teaching myself immediately if I want to get from here to there, this is what you do. And so that was the whole reason. Now, I picked up entertainment and the Superman lore from the more Weisinger days. And of course, later, Julius Schwartz. And there's, there's various visages. But taking this to Henry Cavill, because I can buy George Reeves, I can buy Chris Reeves. I sat there with the Man of Steel and give me a minute here. And I shook my head. I said, no, no, no. And I said, wait a minute. What's this? No, no, no. This is great. Well, the costume. So what? I listened to Bud Collier and the old radio shows a few times a week. Bud Collier came to Earth from Krypton as an adult. I don't know if you know that. And he stops a train wreck. And this boy and his father said, oh, thank you. Sir. Thank you for saving them. Uh, saving us in this train wreck. They said, who are you with that? blue suit and red cape. They didn't mention trucks. Nope. <laughs> red ass on your chest. He goes, I don't know, but maybe some would call me Superman and not. Maybe somebody would call me Stan or Samuel. It was Superman. So if I can suspend believability to buy that. That which, is so awful. <laughs> yeah, which I do. And then I can take Henry Cable. They also tell me, said, my friends, my friends, how can I help people? with the abilities that I have, my new friends on earth. And they said, get a job at a newspaper. That way you know all about the things that are gonna happen and you can be proactive with it and walk among men in their clothing as Clark Kent. And Bud Collier says, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. So needless to say, if I could- Maybe that's why nobody remembers that radio show. <laughs> but if I can buy that, I can buy Henry Cable and I can buy him with the exception of the Justice League movie was not good. But Man of Steel had a lot of good, good stuff, man. I, I actually well, like I, I, the fan edit. Uh, go ahead, Keith. No, I was just going to say. You've been quiet this whole fucking show. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. I, I, I enjoy watching you guys interact. But, you know, my, my thing with, with, with Henry Cavill 
Man of Steel and all of that was came out of the fact that um, the production had started before they brought in Zack Snyder, and that Jonathan Nolan. Uh, oh yeah, because it's not Zach. Yeah, it's not Zach's fault that it sucked. Yeah, it was it, because it, he was forced the to make studio, that. But there was no the studio wanted the studio Superman. wanted the director behind the Dark Knight films to make a Superman movie, and Christopher Nolan decided that he didn't want to because it didn't fit in with the kind of films that he liked to make, and so rather than you know as studios usually do, they had an idea. And they had a date for when the movie was to come out. And so they just literally just started production. They started the drawings and they started the scripts and they, they started building sets. And Nolan decided to bring in Zack Snyder. And so Snyder's coming into this with a script that's basically already written and, and needed to help as far as casting figure out so his his contribution to man of steel was finding henry cavill oh and bringing him in yeah and then being promised by warner brothers that when they would make man of steel 2 that it would fit more along the lines of what you know both henry cavill and Zack snyder wanted and so when the time came to promote the movie all of the interviews for Man of Steel with Zack Snyder, you hear Snyder talking about Man of Steel 2. Hmm. And so when the movie comes out, does what it does at the box office, Warner Brothers came to Zack Snyder and said, look, this movie did not do what we wanted it to do. I mean, you hit a lot of the marks. People really seem to like Henry. So we're going to help you out. And we want to bring in more of the DC characters. So for the next movie, you are going to use Batman and Wonder Woman. And Zach was like, well, that's cool, but shouldn't we just complete the rest of Superman's story and go ahead and make Man of Steel 2? And Warner Brothers was very insistent on the use of those characters. And this, this falls under what we've talked about ad nauseum, which is studio yeah. interference by Warner Brothers. They're, they're one of the worst. Yeah, um, well, and, 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 go ahead. I was going to say, look where it's gone. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing. You had a lot of people that had no real investment in the character. You had a director who was under duress and being judged for what he was to do with all of this stuff that had been basically pushed on him to do. And his original contract was for five movies. And so in making Batman v Superman, he was also under the understanding that they wanted him to also cross into Justice League. Oh. So he came at it from, I have to make five movies and I have to make this work. And so he used Batman v Superman as the introduction to Justice League, which at the time was going to be three films. And I will also point out that the film that he shot of Justice League is not the film that we got. Yeah. Um, like, that, uh, and there's only, what, 10% of that movie, Justice League, is actually and what he, he was shot. over 70% shot. It was over 70% yeah. shot, and they only used 10% of the film. That he shot. The rest of it. The rest of it was just reshot by Joss Whedon, and yeah. uh, and it's got stupid shit in it, like Batman going, uh, was about the bleeding, and I'm like, oh, something's bleeding. Uh, what? Yeah, uh, basically, DC. I mean, they, basically, Warner Brothers did to Zack Snyder. People like you, Rick. Hey, I'm doing a lot of record right now. Can you not call for a while? Fine. Oh. I'm really sorry if you have to edit that out. I just that was. I apologize. <laughs> No apologies needed, man. We're pretty, uh, yeah, it's all we good. don't care. Here's my parole <laughs> but, officer. My parole officer what? calls us time to make. <laughs> <laughs> but but so, ultimately, what you had was a situation where there was a lot of interference by studio suits, and we never really got Zack Snyder and the way that he saw the character truly. He was building towards something based on what Warner Brothers was pushing him to do. 
And so in doing that, uh, he had his, his point of view with Man of Steel was looking at it as a science fiction story, which when you think about it, the basis, when you strip it down, Superman is really two stories. It's a comic book superhero story and a science fiction story meshed together. And I always thought that was an interesting idea. Now, did I agree with every single thing in the film? Eh, no, I wouldn't have done it that way. But I understand what he had been given and what the script had said, because the script was locked. The studio had approved the script. So aside from his only contribution being what they did at the end with Zod, everything else is pretty much locked in from the script. And then he had to build the Justice League. He had to build everything towards the Justice League. And then he got kicked off the movie when he was over 70% done. Uh, and they brought in Joss Whedon, who himself was being told what to do. And remember, this is the guy that yeah. had just come off the single movie the Avengers. that screwed two directors. <laughs> <laughs> Warner, and, Brothers. And Warner Brothers. I mean, they're just Did always it. trying to really hit it out of the park with their fucking directors over. <laughs> well, ultimately, you found out that the reason why when Joss had come to Warner Brothers and said, look, I need more time. You know, you guys have this hard date for us to meet. It would make more sense if you gave me more time to finish everything. And and the CEO of Warner Brothers at that time told him no. So basically, all the problems that they had with Henry Cavill and the whole thing with his lip and all that was brought about because Warner Brothers was in the middle of their deal with AT&T. And the head of Warner Brothers and the executives felt that Chances were they weren't going to be, they won't have jobs when everything would happen. They wanted their Christmas bonus. And the only way they were going to get a major bonus was to have the movie come out, no matter what. And it did. And then they got away with basically, you know, shoving everybody towards, hey, it's, 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 it's Zack Snyder's fault. Here he is. And they shoved <laughs> him towards the mask. You know, I, you know and, I still managed to enjoy 50% of that movie. Um, yeah. But uh, I actually, once I saw the fan cut of it that was based off of what they believed Zack Snyder was doing, uh, I found it to be a superior film, and I can't even watch the theatrical cut anymore. Um, but but I'm looking like forward that. to... Where, where can I find the fan cut of oh, Man of Steel? Uh, uh, I will talk to you about uh, that offline. Oh, yeah. Not on camera. Uh <laughs> Because I can't say on camera that I can get you a copy of that because I would never do that. Oh, <laughs> I think it's a science fiction film. It did well. I think from handling the, the humanity of Parker's little boy, and not to get into all the minutia because Lord knows I can't, but uh, Clark growing up, Clark working at the bar, whatever, I thought that was all just great if I could suspend myself from the Mort Weisinger mythos, which I have to, embrace it openly like I did the radio show, it's a damn fine series of vignettes. It really is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, it's got some great moments. It shows the heroic nature of him. I think uh, uh, my biggest gripe, and Keith will back me up on my saying this before, I hated Jonathan Kent. He was terrible. He wasn't John. I love, I'm a Costner fan, yeah. and I hated the, the, the character. Not the portrayal, the character. Right. I mean, yeah, when he yeah. turned, it's like it was nonsensical yeah. at how fast that Clark Kent can move to tell him not to save him. I'm yeah. like, are you kidding me? It was, it was terrible. It was ridiculous. And that was a uh, major speed bump that had not one bit of merit to help the film, the mythos, the continuity. It's, it might as well have been Aunt May. Yeah, it fit nowhere in the universe, and um, I really dislike that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But everything else I really liked. You know, I disliked yeah. that moment. Yeah. What was it when he he says, should I have let them die? Maybe. And it's like, Jonathan Kent would have never said yeah. that. Now, Keith's argument is, uh, this is a modern farmer who is a little more wary of the government. I still don't believe well, he's yeah, a heartland. It, it, yeah, but my, my, my thing was, this is based on... If you went with the timeline that they had set up with this movie as to it would have been the 80s. Clark, it would have been the yeah. 80s. 
So at that time, farmers in the United States weren't really doing too well. And they were very wary of the government. Unlike when the original Superman comic was written, everybody was more pro, you know, Midwest and, and, and you could believe in the government and versus that era. And so that's the way that they had Jonathan and Martha. Because if, when, you look, when you look at how those characters, and mainly Martha later on, are portrayed, I mean, they get lambasted big time. You, you know, you have the banks foreclosed on the house in, in, in uh, Batman v Superman, and, and all this stuff that happens. And it's all part of that. So that's the farming experience, the Kansas experience of, of, of these films. I don't agree with all of it, but then again, you know, the new Superman series that they have coming for the CW is going to kill off Jonathan Kent in the first episode. Yeah, so. I, uh, I'm not sure about that. Well, I will say one thing. I know that Superman, Kal-El is Kal-El because of Krypton. Mm -hmm. Superman is Superman. Moral fiber, judgments, uh, um, moral compass because of Ma and Pa Kent. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that's why he wears, I think he wears the Kent name proudly because that's that's the guy that does what he does. If not, you guys can help me with the name of this movie. Uh, there was a, a, was it Brightburn that came out of a... Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, I, I made fun of it. I made fun of it. That's him not even trying to write. Yeah, it was a what if. It's kind of what if that character came and Ma and Pa Kent didn't find Clark and well-intended people did, but I think that the Man of Steel is that way because of the the man and the woman from the farm. So, yes, yeah. The thing that bugs me about that kind of writing that was in there is uh, people only die when they do something stupid, and I hate that kind of writing. Yeah. It's like the horrifying story is when you do all the right things and you still get murdered. You know that that's scary. Also. You can't create a character like that and not have something to oppose it. Um, what's terrifying about it's just a slaughter movie. Then, it's it's not a horror film. It's just slaughter. Horror yeah. is there's got to be hope. If there's no hope, then it's not horror. And yeah. um, and that's what scares me about J J Abrams coming in to take over all of the DC movies and particularly Superman because yeah, given. Yeah, I, I don't see how he's going to inject any of that. I have know? learned about this guy that he stopped being able to write after 2006, uh, and he became a producer. And yeah. his idea of storytelling is plot, 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 twist, 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 and very little story. He doesn't know how to write a story anymore. And it's really frustrating because, um, look, man, you can write a story without a plot. But you can't have a plot without a story, and if it's just plot, you got nothing. And well, so my basic write... philosophy is: JJ is not happy until he has shit on every property out there. Well, after after reading his Superman script that got leaked, a few oh yeah, that was so... that was just bad. I mean, and that that it it makes whatever problems that you had with Man of Steel look like nothing. It also makes Kevin okay. Smith's Superman script look like fucking genius. Wow. <laughs> so the script you're talking about that leaked, <clears throat> which I, I've never seen, it, I'm sure you haven't either. What would be some bullet points as to what may have made this even worse call? Oh, that's that's difficult. If there are a couple of pivotal points that made it so bad, because it's always interesting to see when people decide to interpret Superman. Batman, you can interpret the world can interpret it. Yeah, there is yeah. only one way to interpret Superman, and uh, what's his name that directed Superman, the motion picture? Um, oh my God, I just forgot his name. Uh, oh, um. <laughs> his wife uh, produced the X Men. Uh, oh, Richard Donner. 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 Richard Donner. Yeah. You know, there were two things I loved about him. One, the sign that he had over his uh, writing area that said verisimilitude. And two, mm -hmm. he said, Superman can only be portrayed one way. He has to be a Boy Scout to work. If you write him in any other way, he doesn't work. He has to be a Boy Scout. Right. 
Well, you can you can ride him as a boy scout and still you know mess it up, which is what JJ had done. You you could take Superman's story and make it to where he lands on Earth, and he's found by the Kents and raised. But if you mess up the beginning part of the story, which is the foundation, you know, the foundation, which is the destruction of Krypton, and say Krypton never exploded, and then you have the taking jor and Lara, instead of being a scientist and his wife, you make them the king and queen of Krypton. Thus turning Kal-El into a prince. Right. And saying that there are all these bad people who represent Black Zero, who want to take over Krypton, led by Zod, and, 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 and become the new rulers. And so they have to find the prince who got away. And the story pretty much devolved into this whole, you know, thing where uh, Clark was not raised knowing who he was. And meanwhile, there's an FBI task force that is closing in on, you know, they, they find aliens and different things. And they're led by uh, FBI agent Lex Luthor. And uh, Luthor becomes obsessed with tracking down the alien. And it turns out that when you get to the, towards the end of the, the film, Black Zero have located Superman. They do this whole fight scene on the Kent farm, you know, just all the destruction, everything else. And it turns out that there was one more alien. There's an alien that actually got here before Clark did. There was a separate ship that the government found. And there was another baby from Krypton. And at the very end of the film, you find out that it's Lex Luthor. That's JJ's idea from years ago that he originally attempted to, to do. That was his that was his whole thing. That makes me take two aspirins and call you in the morning. That, <laughs> that's that's a pretty pretty strange, weird it's like it's like a fan piece. That should be fanning flames. That's all we're getting. That's all we're getting nowadays is um, somebody opened up the floodgates and started producing fan fiction as yeah. legitimate stories like right. Star Wars, Doctor Who, uh, yeah. Superman, just yeah. all of it. It's just uh, uh, Star it's Trek. It's in fan stories. Yeah, it's just just terrible. It's and terrible that, that's writing. the guy who's currently running all the DC characters on film now and yeah. television if you believe everything this contract says. But uh, he's the guy that's in charge for the yep. next five years. Well, I don't know how financially successful any of this has been, but I did a show a few years ago. I was uh, doing Q&A in Wichita, and we were talking about the need to reinvent Superman every few years, reinvent him, reinvent him. And I had a young lady come up, uh, a college student, who actually was so confident about her opinion she took the mic, which is fine. We became friends, as a matter of fact. And she said, if this is what you're going to do as Superman, kill him. Do a good 12-part story, make it the end of that, then keep all your Superman inventory that you've had over 80 years and start republishing that. Look for a better market that might have more disposable income at not four bucks for a teeny little comic book and see if you can't rebuild on what has been done. Because you ain't going no place now with these characters. And I hate to tell you, I don't disagree with that. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, having worked for both DC and Marvel and seeing what you And he worked for Charlton, to, too. And Charlton, too. Uh, I mean, seriously, what do you think about the current crop of comic books overall? what is being produced, what is being put out there. Uh, 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 now they're talking about 5G for DC. Uh, you've had a lot of back and forth with Marvel, and now they've reinvented completely the X-Men, and now they're doing something really, you know, different with those guys. I mean, do you, do you see this as being sort of a, a healthy direction for those particular companies or... What well, I mean, and that's a good question. First of all, because of the price points, 
like a comic book is four ninety nine, right? Yeah. Two lean cuisines for me. That's two lunches. So I've got to live, I got to be for real and, and make that uh, uh, comparison. Number one. Number two. A lot of the artwork is just beautiful. And I taught at the Art Institute. I taught comics, sequential storytelling, and cartooning. A lot of it is so cold and generic because a lot of heart never makes it to the tablet. And maybe it's because I still like to draw old school. But uh, when it comes to the stories in themselves, they are often, not all the time, but often lackluster for me. There's others that might just love this stuff and won't miss an issue. And I'll do for a comic book day here in town in May. I'm doing Planet Comic Con in a couple of weeks. You'll have a gazillion people there, often buying comic book related stuff, hardbounds, reproductions, but not that many walking out with that issue of this month's, you name it, Spidey or whatever Spidey it is, or Superman or what have you. I really think that Marvel and DC, with all due respect to these talented people, are treading water. Now, financially, I've heard, and there are rumors, okay, maybe you guys have heard this, that DC is doing poorly, and Dan DiDio is gone. And I don't know, somebody might say, hey, you're crazy, sales are just fantastic. I don't know. All I know is I hear industry stuff, you guys can chime in with that. I don't know that Marvel's doing so well. I don't know that the properties that Disney owns from Marvel, AT&T, are they wanting to get rid of, of DC because they're a handicap to them? The characters and the intellectual properties are worth gold. Comic books as we know them, I don't think they are. So please correct me if I'm wrong. No, well, Tom Waltz over at IDW and I have talked about this ad nauseum, which is that comic books really haven't turned a profit since the mid-70s. Boom. And uh, and it's the cost of printing to the – basically, the readership never really grows. It, it pretty much stays level. And uh, and they can say whatever they want to. They're spinning bullshit. It costs so much to make comic books now. They're not getting the extra sales that they need. And worse than that, they're, they're putting out stories nobody wants to read, which is why mom and pop shops are closing. Yeah. So, no, that's an absolute lie if they say that. Uh, and it's pro proof is in the pudding that if you were doing well, the mom and pop shops would be doing well, but they're not. They can't sell your freaking comics. Right. And uh, and most of your comic book stores are now specialized in selling other things. Uh, yes. Like for us, well, you know them too, is vintage stock here in Missouri. Uh, yeah, you got it there. Um, I love vintage stock, man. And uh, but you know. Comics is one small section in their store now, whereas it used to be half their store, if not most of their store. It's now one little corner. And they can't carry everything. And uh, they become, it was their, if you want comics, you've got a special order. You're not going to believe this. This happened about a year ago. I actually called my dear friend Paul Kepperberg from this office and told him I was shocked. I went to a comic store that's been in Kansas City for 25 years more. Okay. I walked in, I talked to the, uh, uh, the uh, associate working there, a nice young college lady, you know, young lady. And we talked, and I said, it's comic stage. She goes, yes, I know. And I said, where's Superman? And she said, we don't carry Superman. You have to special order. True story, guys. You have to special order Superman. And yeah, I now, going back to the 70s, you know, with what you're talking about, uh, the point is, is that even though they weren't turning a profit with comics since the 70s, they were breaking even. And but most of all, they were earning money through merchandising and, and uh, uh, li licensing. And lifestyle branding is what they call it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, comic books since the 90s have changed that business model. They've changed it. And uh, we, now we're seeing this. Uh, different kind of business model that doesn't work it doesn't work and it's caused thousands of comic shops to close around the world not just in the wow. united states you know and look man uh if they're saying that they're turning a profit that i will tell them right to the face you're a fucking liar yeah. because uh, comics have never turned a profit ever i, I remember during the, the and i i thought the world jack con 
because I was in DC when she was, uh, um, she, she had the lead there. I thought she was innovative. I thought she was great. I thought she worked so well with Dick Giordano, who had opened the door to better page rates, royalties, better treatments. It broke his heart when the guys left to uh, uh, create um, Impulse. Impulse? Uh, is it Impulse? Image. Image. That's right. I'm sorry. See, I forgot. But I was at the DC party when the guys walked up and said, we've decided to do this. You've been great, but we're going to start our own company. And again, it was Image. And... Uh, he was crushed, but there was a great deal of care that Jeanette had, that Dick contributed to, people back then too that worked there. But keep in mind, my understanding is that Wonder Woman was failing. The other books were doing okay, just kind of okay. And it's like, why are you guys still publishing Wonder Woman? Because you're, go you're going in, in the red if you haven't already. They said, it's not the comic book that makes us money, it's all the products. But we can't have the products be uh, credible. Yeah, they're not relevant if you don't have a comic to, to support it. Right. Yeah, see the, the, rain, the Wonder Woman raincoat, the lunchbox, the T-shirts, that's all good. But if you can't trace that back to its genesis, which is that genesis pool of funny books, then it seems to lose a lot of credibility. And that's why we're seeing such a uh, also a dump in sales for Star Trek, even classic characters, because people are forgetting what Star Trek was. You know, and so, the, you know, I, was it McFarland that started doing the new Star Trek figures, which I have some of them, but they, they, he dropped out because he's, they're just not selling. And yeah. once again, I blame J.J. Abrams for that shit. You know, um, he, you know, he didn't make classic Star Trek yeah. uh, and less Moonves too. I mean, come on, let's put the blame where it belongs. But, yeah. um, you know, Les Moonves is the one who split it apart with uh, Sherry Redstone's dad, um, uh, um, Sumner, Sumner, Red uh, yeah. Redstone. You know they broke up uh, Star Trek in in 2005, and it's been limping since. Uh, it's a wounded animal. So the comic books, DC and Marvel are wounded animals, and they have people working there now that don't care for it. They don't well, really want to nurse it back uh, to health. I was listening to a podcast, and they had uh, two people that used to work for Disney, and they put it out there that as far as the Disney upper management are concerned, they could care less what happens to Marvel comics, because yeah. as you were saying earlier, it just doesn't really do anything for them. It's all about the It doesn't make management. any money for them. It, it costs them money. They're not turning a profit with those comics. It keeps the uh, properties alive. And that's it. And uh, eventually, you know, DC is on the verge of being shut down now. Uh, what's his name? Um, I just forgot his name, um, uh, Van Skyver. Uh, oh, yeah. Ethan Van Skyver was saying that, uh, you know, he believes that they're they're one step away from having their doors shut at DC by Warner. Well, and that, and, and with CBS selling uh, Simon & Schuster. That, oh, that yeah. That, really, I just heard about that yesterday. Yes. Yes. That's huge. It, it is not going to end very well for DC and Marvel. And as I've been saying for quite a while, a lot of people like to see it as two separate things. It's really the same thing. What happens to DC is going to happen to Marvel because yeah. once Warner Brothers or really AT&T, once they figure out a way of, of getting rid of all of this yet still making everything, you're going to have some Disney executive just going, well, why are we still doing this? Exactly. Why are Eventually we someone's going to go, come on, guys. And see, um, my, my thought, if I could share this, guys, is – Siegel and Schuster, the Bob Kane Studios, because that's who created all of this stuff. Stan and Jack and Joe Simon. Nobody ever created these characters to last for 90 years. Mm -hmm. After a while, the, the stories peter out, and, as, as well they should. And so if you look at the economic side of this, they own everything that they've got their hands on when it comes to inventory over the last 90 years that they could reproduce. Stop. Reproduce this. I got a collection to point over there on my bookshelf of all the Superman dailies from the 50s to the 60s, all the Superman Sundays from World War II, which are my favorite Superman pieces by Wayne Boring, who was always great, but he was brilliant during World War II. All the stuff that's been reprinted through the Silver Age uh, 60s with DC and the new look of Batman and Marvel. I would, if they start all over from the 50s through up to the 90s, 
republishing those in trade paperbacks or hardbound books, I'd spend money on it. And, and it costs... Yeah. Well, no. that's one of the things that IDW is, is best for is um, the fact that it has the largest uh, reprint library. Yes. And right. they should be reprinting all of that for DC. Yes. And what's it going to cost DC? Nothing. They own, they own the artwork. That's right. Do a Superman book. Do uh, two trade paperbacks a year, but do them really, really well. And that'll be your new comics for the year. Other than that, call the patient before somebody else does. Right. Yeah. It's just a wreck. Hey, let's circle back a little bit because okay. we kind of went off on an ADD tangent with this. <laughs> um, we're just guys talking about shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I wanted to go back to, you know, because you're, you know, because uh, we're going to be talking next to, to my buddy uh, Chuck uh, Dixon. Oh, yeah. And, and um, we're yeah. actually going to be doing it tonight. And, um, it, but basically, you know, we're going to be focusing more on those years while he was in. You are one of my few friends that worked in the Silver Age of comics. Well, if you got you got to call the Silver Age. I'm a big Silver Age fan, and that's my biggest influence. However, I started in the late '70s from a, a fan standpoint, and then started to garner more and more attention in my heydays at DC, and then later at Marvel, later at Warner Brothers, later at Disney and Charles and stuff. We're really more to the early to mid '80s. So Silver Age wise, uh, as most Silver Age guys are, I'm pretty doggone knowledgeable because I got to work with the Silver Age artists. I got to work with. Um, oh, that was what it was. Okay. Yeah, uh, work with the Dick Sprangs of the world, the Kurt Swans of the world. When I say work with them, maybe on books, maybe on just doing shows with them, or quite honestly, becoming friends with some of these guys. What my regard for Julia Schwartz is paramount, it's like family. Uh, I, I, my second show I ever did, I did with Stan, I think I sent you pictures, in 75. Uh, so we're going back to those days. So my work really started escalating in the early 70s, but it was in the 80s when I was working at DC and then Marvel and all the other places too. Although I did tons of fan stuff for that. So I did the All-Star Comics Review, I worked for um, uh, buyer's guy, you know, a weekly buyer's guy that used to come out way before there was a TMZ, there was that, and that's basically where I'm coming from. Well, who was your favorite that you got to work with? Oh, I can't say. Uh, I, I've been so fortunate to get to hang with them all. Julie Schwartz, I used to call on Saturday afternoons when he had retired and talk to him about the new look Batman, <clears throat> talk to him about. How Joe Kubert bought a convertible when he worked there and was after the office secretary that Julie said, I like her better, I'm going to marry her. And he did. Um, I love Stan Lee, the Stan Lee stories back when you could just sit around in the lobbies of the hotels and hang out and just visit for hours were so much fun. Um, wow. I met a kid in 1983 that came up to my table in Wichita. And I was in marketing at that point. I was doing art director work and doing comics on the side. And uh, he said, well, you signed this ad. It was an ad in the newspaper. I thought, what? You know, because I had worked for a corporate corporation. And I said, I'm doing comics here now. And he says, I know. My name is Mark Wade, and I'd like to see if you can help me get into comics. That's 1980-something, you know. And uh, Mark and I became friends and brought him to some parties. And then he connected and went on with people. It's, I really can't pick any favorite people to work with. I worked with Roy Thomas on Shazam. I interviewed with him in 1970. Well, was, if you can't pick a favorite, but can you find a story that is your favorite story that happened to you while working with somebody? I really... That you can tell on national television? Yeah, yeah. oh, of course, absolutely. <laughs> uh, um, I've got so many of them, I can't find nor focus on just one. Uh, Paul Paul Kupperberg, I'll just say this. Uh, we became good buddies. We worked together on the Doom Patrol omnibus that came out. I'm gesturing over there uh, in November. We worked on some other pieces together. Um, we're still very close friends. And we've got a project that we're looking at now for an uh, industrial publication. You'll like this. It's called Operation Barbecue. 
What Operation Barbecue does is it centers a lot of volunteers throughout the Midwest that go to the Nashvilles when they're in trouble. And they set up food tents and they cook and they feed people, etc. And Paul and I, as of last week, started bantering about ideas with them. Mike Gold was instrumental in uh, my uh, uh, career. We've been friends since before we worked together in comics. So I really can't focus on any one story now. One will come to me later, I guarantee you. Or maybe well, there's one comic in particular that I'm really curious about because I don't remember this comic at all. What is it? Uh, you worked with uh, uh, Thomas and Dan, uh, or Dan and Dan what's his name? Th it was Dan Thomas and her husband, Roy. Uh, and uh, uh, what's his name? Something Magyar. Um, Magyar. It was Roy Thomas. His Roy wife, Thomas. That was it. Yeah. He'll be a guest of Planet Comic Con in a couple weeks. His wife Dan. Rick Magyar. And, and the comic was called, was it Captain Nazi or what was it? Yeah, no, no, Shazam. I did Captain Mark, uh, I did Shazam, uh, and we did it in Action Comics Weekly. They gave me Shazam the same year they gave Perez Wonder Woman and they gave John Byrne Superman. Yeah, but what is this character? I've never heard of him before. He was called uh, Captain Cap Nazi. Yeah, Captain Nazi was a, a bad guy back in the, uh, uh, you know, World War II. And yes. I've never heard of him. Oh, I've yeah. never heard of him. Oh, Google him. And you can see some of the crazy stuff, plus the artwork I did. Captain because Nazi. the version you did, he was a neo-Nazi. Well, yes. I guess he was about as neo as you could get. But he was <laughs> a white supremacist group, and he had a lot of white kids in a place called Aryan Acres. And I guess they kidnapped somebody. Roy wrote this. He wrote it as kind of a, a springboard for even more Shazam stories. And I don't... I don't know if they did it after that or not. Tom Mandrake might have done some stuff. but I was really curious because I saw your name associated with that, and I'm like, okay, I've got to ask about this. Oh, yeah, Shazam, Captain Marvel, for those of you who don't remember the Fawcett publication and the DC publication, I did that with Roy. But before that, I did Captain Thunder and Blue Bolt with Roy about a father-son team. And this is the same kind of premise as a uh, superhero dad, superhero kid, and great stories of daring do with zombie monsters in Las Vegas. So that was lots of fun. Now keep in mind, Roy Thomas was the first person I ever interviewed with. That was at Marvel. And he was so rough on me in 1970 that Marie Severin took me under her wing and said, come here, I like your portfolio. And you don't, you've got to let this roll off. Here's a new comic we have coming out this week by Barry Smith. It's called Conan, and it's Conan number one. You can read this on your way back to your hotel room. So um, that was the summer I met Dick Giordano when I first interviewed for DC. And, of course, Roy and then Marie Severin. But there's, there's tons of stories about all this stuff. You know, That's this, this sounds like the kind of stuff that you should definitely put into a book. Because these are the kinds of stories that I think should be told, should be heard. Especially by people still in the industry. Are these, but, in, are these in your book? No, as a matter of fact, the guy told me before, he said, why don't you write your uh, uh, mementos about the comic world and this and that. And I start writing, started writing some silly little poetry and things that were very Shel Silverstein, then very Steve Allen, who is my hero. And then... Uh, am I you look like Steve Allen. Huh? You look like Steve Allen. That's the nicest compliment I could ever get from anybody. I have up here, I'm going to turn this so you can see it. No, you probably can't. I have an autographed... Oh... Letter from him, a personal letter. Wow. wow. I met him um, in 2000 in Lawrence, Kansas, at one of his last presentations of the old Tonight Show. And in a lengthy story that I'll spare you, by happenstance, I met him at the end of the show and was invited to a private party. And I spent 40 years, as all of his hardbound books are here and all this memorabilia, I told him about his influence that he was to me. I told him that Julia Schwartz, back at D.C., went down the escalator with him going to the NBC commissary and said, Steve, you look like Cluck Kent, Cluck, C-L-U-K. You look like Cluck Kent. We're going to put you in the, in the comics. And, of course, I'm going to readjust this. He did. I had a copy of that. Uh, I remember that. Boom. I gave it to Steve Allen, and I poured out my creative art to him. At the end of the evening, we shook hands. I thought, I've met, man, 
I met the one, the anointed one. Hey, stop. You going. know, he's another guy that inspired me as well because um, when I took up playing piano as a teen, there you go. Um, I remember where I saw an interview with him where he wrote a song every single day for his wife. 8,500 songs in the Guinness Book of World Records. And uh, and if you look on my computer hard drive at all the songs I've written, I'm upwards of close to about 800. There you and, go. Um, and it's just, uh, and nobody will ever hear them. They're just little things I doodled out on piano. Yeah. And But he's the one that inspired me to do that, to try to write a song every day. Yeah, I told you we were brothers from another mother. I told you. You know, after I met him, he was walking away. He was elderly, and he had sciatic, so he's having a hard time walking. He stopped. He actually turned around, and he, he said what he used to say. He said, well, sir, come here. And he said, can I have your address and your phone number? And I said, yeah. And I gave it to him, and that was like on a Tuesday night, Lawrence. I lived about 40 minutes away in Kansas City. Uh, I came home, told my wife about this, and she was just joyous for me. Because, again, I've got all his books that inspired the poetry. I read a book he wrote in the 50s called Rye on the Rocks. That's the first mm. book I, I own. It. And that's why I wrote poetry, too. But uh, um, Saturday, I went out to the community mailbox. There's a big cardboard box from him to me. It's got six or seven books. It's got this personal letter. It's got an autograph on the cover of a book. Um, Numerous little books in there, and then he made for me. I'm going to show this to you off the camera about a half dozen homemade little cassettes. And I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> yes, I can. And it says, You can probably read this better than me Steve Allen, Beautiful Songs by Steve Allen, Volume, volume Two. I got like six or eight of these things of jazz, beautiful songs. And he must have duped these himself because they are fraught with beautiful mistakes. Of uh, you know, two bars of a song here, and then some dead space, then you know, a minute or two. Well, that was in two in October of two thousand, and he died on Halloween of two thousand. Took his grandkids home from trick or treat. He died, and that was uh, <clears throat> fortunately one of the last uh, adventures that I had. Might have been <laughs> him, so. Yeah, he was. Wow. Uh, he was the end of an era. Um, yes. I mean, true pioneer. Yeah. And there is a renaissance man. I think when people told, asked me when I was a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? I thought, him. I want to be a renaissance. I want to do everything. I want to walk through every appropriate door that I can. Wow. Wow. Uh, ta -da, ta -da. Yeah, it's like, um, yeah, it, guys like him always inspired me. Uh, because, um, you know, and people are like weirded out because like when I got hired by IDW, do you know what my first job was with them? What? What's that? I did the animated, I directed the animated trailers for their comic titles. Um, oh. Yeah. Uh, I did animation. Uh, I had voiceover artists, plus I did voiceover too. And I'm a composer, so I would compose all the music for their, their comic titles, including, the, they were like, Hey Gary, we have this uh, uh, all hell Megatron coming out for Transformers, but we don't want to pay the licensing fee for the theme. Can you emulate the theme without actually using the theme? Uh, yeah, I'll just you know transpose the notes and do it exactly the same way, but the notes will be slightly different, so it it, it won't be a copyright infringement. And so my Transformer, I did the animation for it, designed the entire thing for how it would play out, and then I scored. The Transformer theme that is not the Transformer theme, but it is, but it is not. Gotcha. I got gotcha. you. Been there, done that. That's really good. I will tell you one thing, if you don't mind. Um, I know I'm using, using up a lot of your time. I hope that's okay. No, I don't mind if we go over. Okay. What, what, what I'm doing now is I do commissioned illustrations. I love doing that in Comic Con. So much. Yeah, I've seen some of your stuff. Yeah, thank you. I uh, hope you like it. Um, oh, of course I do. I love your artwork, bro. Yeah. I've got over 60 tracks on this double album, the double CD that I produced. I have some guest voices with me. Uh, one of the reasons when we started cutting up and doing our Irish brogue is if you go to my YouTube site, I wrote and recorded a song doing all the voices and playing all the instruments called Let's Get Drunk and Fight. And it's fun. It's kind of a fun song. It's a very Irish song. It makes fun of the Irish side of me Italian heritage and stuff. <laughs> but I've got this, and I've got my book, and I've got probably 10 times more material. 
Here's why that's important to me. Um, putting my feelers out to you guys. I'm not looking for anything but just friends to play with. What I mean by that is I'm working with Piper Mantis Literary right now. And I have an agent, and I want to take a selected amount of my work. I want to make different animated vignettes. I want to do a lot of the voices myself. I want to bring in guest voices that you never think would do guest voices on this. Much like Good Night Moon, does that anthology? You might have seen it on HBO from book. Mm -hmm. I want to do my own anthology. I want to shop it for streaming or for HBO or for Netflix or whatever. And to be frank with you, I would, I would like to make something in my retirement age now for myself and take care of some situations. But I want to open up a sizable donation above board for everybody to see that would carry me from here to St. Jude's Hospital into the break room with Marlo Thomas and say, this is for you because your father inspired me, being part of Lebanese myself, with his dreams. And this is for St. Jude's Hospital. And Marlo Thomas inspired me with my lust and passion for New York. And the opening scenes from that girl, enough to save money the day I got out of high school or a day or two later. I was gone, baby. I'm never coming back. I, I did later. But that is my end game goal. So when it comes to voices or animation or ideas and stuff, I want to gather a bunch of people as my last project, do that, and, uh, and leave a better world behind. But... Um uh, anyway, I, I love the fact that you're you're a true Renaissance man. You get out there and you, you, you write your poetry. You. Um, and I've been wanting to get you on the podcast for a while because I think yeah. I brought it up to you like a, a year ago. Um, I said something to you then. The movie thing together a little over a year ago. Yeah, because uh, that's him and me. That's Keith and I. We've been doing that. And uh, this is just uh, an offshoot of that. It's still part of the same show. Just two nerds talking. Like the thing says, but talking nerdy, nerd, nerd stuff, you know, and uh, it's like people go, you know, like what inspired the show? I said, this is how we talk. Yeah. We get on the phone and we talk for like two to three hours yeah. and just we decided to start recording it yeah. on video this and putting like, it out. This is like doing a panel like we've done before. So yeah. it, feels, it feels like home. Just I won't, I'm not breaking a chair. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Hey, say something to John about getting me up there. I would love to go up there and, and bring Keith because okay. we are we are the number one regional uh, video podcast. Well, what, I'll tell you what I'm going to do then right now. I'm going to do a little screenshot so everybody looks pretty. And I will, I will tuck that into a, an FB message to him. And boom, looks good. And uh, from that standpoint, say, hey, these guys, now come on. And uh, John's, John's a great guy. He has a lot of good help. Everybody up there is, are, are fantastic. But, boy, they get spread thin. I mean, that's a lot to take on with these shows. So I don't want you guys to get lost in the mire. I'll say that to him. Also, are you guys coming to Planet Comic Con? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I am. You know, Keith, Keith needs to talk to him again and remind him that he was going to have us. Uh, we are going to be at Vision Con. You need to be at Vision Con. Tell me about that because I'd like to find out where and when I'd go. It's in May. It used to be in March. May 1st. Yeah, okay. but it, it, this year it is May 1st through the 3rd, uh, and it'll be here in Springfield at their Expo Center. Okay. Well, let's, let's see about that. That's good. Now, is that free comic book day? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, is it? I got to yeah. Yeah. Hold on, let me double check. Uh, uh, I'll be at Clint's comic. Free comic book day 2020. May 2020. May 2nd, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, yeah. That's, yeah, I've got a commitment then, but uh, that doesn't mean we can't uh, figure out something for next time. I'm open. Hey, you guys do the brand. Do you do the What's Branson it? show? The what? Oh, Branson? Yeah, we just did it. Okay, I missed it. Yep, Maybe. we interviewed. Uh, uh, oh God, I just forgot his name. Kevin Sorba. I'd love to meet him. What a great guy! What He's a great so guy. freaking nice. Yeah, I bet he is. Yeah, we did the 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 Vulcan uh, salute instead of touching hands. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's great. That's so great. Yeah. You know, you got a nerd when they can do it. Oh yeah, they know what it means. Absolutely right. 
Yeah, in fact, if you remember sitting next to me, I would give free artwork if people could give me the response. I would say live long and prosper. And if you know the response, you get a free piece of artwork. I don't I think it's part of not that. responsible. I know, I know it. What is it, Keith? It's peace and long life. That's right. I love it. Live long and prosper, peace and long life. There you go. Sounds that, good. Sounds that's because we're nerds. Nerdy, nerd, nerd, nerds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, but we're all old school nerds. And the thing I hate about today's nerds is they don't understand what being a real nerd was. Um, you know, everybody thinks they see the, the that show um, uh, Big Bang Theory and they think that's what all nerds are. It's yeah. like, no, Jim Woodward, who is uh, the um, uh, manager of the Facebook page for, for what we do. And uh, he's one of my oldest friends on this planet. I've known him for over 40 years. And he and I were brawling nerds. We fought all the time. Never took an ass whooping. We gave them. Uh, we get, get messed with by bullies, and we would just go, all right, bring it. And we'd go. Yeah. And, but that's because of, you know, who we were. And so when we see the modern take on television and film of nerds, it kind of annoys me. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, we, you know, I hate saying this word, but we, we weren't pussies. No. We, we, if we got our ass beat, we still gave a hell of a fight, but we never got our ass beat. Not once. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, he and I beat up a couple of the same bullies. And uh, I did it one year, he did it the next year, and then I do it again. And we just kept repeating, going, these guys just don't learn. <laughs> there you go. Would there you write, well, you growing up in KC, what was that like? I was an army of one. We really didn't have anybody that I could share. Oh, this sounds goofy. A lot of people didn't understand what I was doing. Even during high school, it's like, I oh, like strong comic book characters, and yet. I finally found a guy when I was a senior in high school, and I said, I just read this great comic book about Gwen Stacy dying. You want to look at it? And he said, I, I, I guess. You know, when I finally, finally found out that there was a Clint's Books and Comics downtown, long before the owner that purchased it right after that, Jim Cavanaugh purchased it. We became best friends until he was killed a couple of years ago. I really had nobody to talk to about this. So... It just kind of stayed in here, and that's why I tried to get the Clint's about once a week. Maybe to buy comics, they were they were thirty cents a piece, or just to talk to people who liked Bill Everett's Doctor Strange, yeah, or wanted to see something by Howard Chaykin, or you know these people. So that that became our opportunities to go to the direct sales stores, and they started sprouting up after that. And have these conversations. I'd also stand there with my artwork and say, "What do you think?" And people think like, "I, I don't know. Am I supposed to know something about your artwork just to get input from people?" But when it came to that specialized interest, I, yeah, I was pretty much on my own with that for a long time. Now, when conventions started taking off, and I started doing shows in '74 and '75, it exploded into fandom. And fandom was fun. So we talk about nerds and stuff. The only thing I have reservation with is so many of the nerds that are now moving into uh, contemporary times are elitists. And you think, wait a minute, pop culture is pop culture. And there's a sense of superiority that you're bringing to the table because of Doctor Who. You know, everybody have fun tonight. Everybody Wang Chung tonight. So. <laughs> and with that, I think we'll wrap it up here. All right. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Uh, love you, brother. You're the, just right, brother. one of the, the coolest guys I know. Um, with that, that's Rick Stassi, and that down there is Keith. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> take, a, take a look at the, my, my website, www.rickstacy.com. Link great. will be down below the video. Okay. And and because there's some fun stuff there about spoken word, about the charities I try to do some stuff with. Comics are fun, too, but uh, all these things that are in. And Outstanding. I do conventions and stuff. I do an awful lot of uh, uh, performing uh, with my spoken word. I do it for charities. I do it for harvesters. And, you know, admission is a loaf of bread, some canned goods and stuff. Hey, if you ever want to do one of your spoken words uh, on our channel, uh, you can uh, uh, take up any time you want to do it. Let's talk about that sometimes. 
All right, brother. Take well, care. And hey, guys, get out of here. Get off our lawns. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for watching Pop Culture Minefield. If you've enjoyed the show, please remember to like and subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell icon. Remember, you can find us at Pop Culture Minefield on both Facebook and Instagram. Thank you again. Yeah, is the lighting okay here, guys? That's, I don't know if you want that or not. Yeah, Looks got, good. Looks good. Uh, I've got key lighting in front of me. Uh, I've got ba basically, uh, uh, you know, Keith was made in heaven, so he's just naturally lit well. He, he's very angelic. <laughs>